the Black Girls and Women's Consortium knows that they can call me at any point. I'm going to drop everything and I'm going to be present because I believe in the mission and the work of Southern Black Girls and Women's. Absolutely. And so today I get to pour into you all what I have found to be an avenue that many, many people don't uh, recognize to be an area of sustainability, community, and legacy. And so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to say the word for today is grace. So the word for today is grace. If you all can see my screen, thumbs up. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so get to the money, right? We're going to talk about how do we get to the money. The government space has money available for you, regardless of the type of business that you have, whether you are a sole proprietor, an LLC, a nonprofit, even maybe if you are an escort for our big rollers, there is government grant contract money available for you and non-grant uh, money as well. But when we go off into this presentation, I want to make sure you all pay attention to the fact that government contracting truly does create sustainability, community, and legacy. I am Kristen Webb, your CEO uh, for the Great U Leadership Series. I've been in government contracting for about 20 years, um, so I love all things about it, and I will try my best not to um, ooze all over the screen with it and go at a good pace because it really is a lot of information to delve off into. Um, I'm also a certified procurement professional, and I do go around the country and train uh, governmental entities on best practices for uh, public government procurement. So what are we going to talk about in the next 40 minutes, if you all could oblige me in that way and indulge me? Um, we are going to talk about understanding what government contracting is, um, its benefits, how governments approach contracting, how to get started in government contracting, and then lastly, how to explore, or we're going to explore, I'm sorry, best practices for navigating the government contracting space. So before I do that, I wanna learn just a little bit more about you all. Drop into the chat if you are either uh, thinking about starting a business, uh, that means you're getting ready to get started. Uh, maybe you have already started your business and you're really early on in that space, however you define early on, or maybe put in the chat if you've been doing this a long time. I want to know who are my seasoned people, seasoned business owners, because while you are here for me to share information, I want to make sure that you all understand who's in the room and potentially who you all could connect with and network beyond this moment. So drop in the chat. I kind of want to understand um, the business models that we have. Are we newbies? Are we um, been in it for a while? Or are we seasoned veterans in this space? So I see new business owner. I see newbie. I like I like newbies. I love my newbies. I can start out molding you. <laughs> awesome, awesome new business owner. And this is also good for me so I can make sure that I speak to my audience and make sure that I really hone in on uh, what's going to be most important to you all. So as we go throughout, drop things in the chat. I will stop periodically to make sure that I'm answering those questions. And of course, I will make it available uh, for you all to connect with me afterwards. So I also see Stephanie, not so new, about a decade as a business owner. I love that too. Um, because that means, again, more growth, more reinforcement that you're going to experience here today. So feel free to continue dropping that in the chat. And we're going to go ahead and delve in. So getting to the money, drop that in the chat. I need engagement periodically. Drop that in there. Getting to the money, because that's what we're going to talk about. So what is government contracting? What is it exactly? It is the method for government agencies to secure the delivery of goods and services. They're simply looking for goods and services to be able to satisfy their roles and responsibilities to the constituents. That's even you as a taxpayer, right? We are going to talk, how do you get to the money? How are you able to provide goods and services to the government that they are seeking out? Or maybe they don't know that they're seeking it. Maybe they need to be introduced to it. And we'll kind of talk about that as well. But the government contracting simply means that they are using they are using various methods to procure goods and services. So think about uh, the type of good or service that you provide and drop that in the chat. Let us know what is your business. Drop it in the chat right now. All right, so let's look at it at a macro level. A lot of times when we think about government contracting and grant money and the availability of funds at the government level, we typically think about the federal government, right? Um, or at least that's the feedback that I often get. 
um, that we're looking at the at the federal level. But even in your backyards, in the at the local level or the state level, there is opportunity. And so I'd like to show this snapshot that shows that there are 16,360 townships. You have special districts. You have local governments, 9,000 plus. We have cities and counties and even schools that make up public procurement. And those are large numbers. And if you add them all up and you look at the sum of them, there is much and many opportunities to be found in those uh, entities, each and every one of them. And the availability and the opportunity may be there just for you. I see in the chat, we have bakeries, STEM education, self-care specialists for caregivers. So, and I can say in my experience, Absolutely, there is a space in government contracting for all of that. Even with balloons and marquee number rentals, um, there is a space for you in governmental contracting. So what are the numbers? Let's look at the federal government. We'll start there because one thing to keep in mind, the federal government trickles money down to the state and local level, right? So if the federal government has the money, you can best believe a lot of it when it shows up at the state level, when it's showing up at the local level, even those are grant funds or funds that are coming directly from federal government and being redistributed through those agencies. So $682 billion in 2022. Drop that in the chat. Getting to the money if you want to see $682 billion, right? $682 billion is the spend or was the spend for 2022. And even in that spend, the federal government has a specific focus on specific demographics to help leverage or create, or I should say, uh, close a gap between potential disparities for small businesses, small disadvantaged businesses, uh, veteran-owned small businesses, women-owned small businesses, and hub zone. And if you look at those, 23% is a goal that they set for small businesses last year, and they actually surpassed it at 26.5% which was $162 billion for small businesses that were spent at the federal level. And while I won't go through each of these numbers, I always like to show this snapshot so that again, it speaks to the volume of the availability and the access for you to be able to support your company for, for sustainability, for community, and for legacy. So feel free to take a snapshot of it and it came from sba.gov. All right, so what, there are many, many layers. I always like to say government has layers. We hear red tape, we hear bureaucracy, uh, we hear sometimes inefficiency, we hear slow processes, but guess what? It really is a system in place that is uh, set up to really create a fair and transparent process. And so when we look at the ecosystem, government agencies, again, if we start from the left, federal, state, and local level, each of those levels, each of those thousands of um, entities that I mentioned on the screen previously, they all have separate legislation. While they may have to adhere all to federal guidelines, they can still at the state level and even at the local and agency level have legislation and policies that they have to adhere by. So being able to understand what those are as you engage with these entities is going to be important. And we'll talk about that. You'll have the procurement department. They are going to be your best friends. You want to get to know your purchasing office. You want to get to know the contracts administration offices within the government spaces. And you even want to get to know the user areas. If you're able to build relationships, you want to get in there and build relationships and create introductions so that they are aware of what you provide. And so uh, building those relationships and that rapport and establishing uh, that through the procurement office is really key. Uh, to the uh, government contracting space. Supply diversity, whenever they are looking for um, specific minorities or they're looking for small businesses and they want to create uh, um, a space where they're closing the gap and leveraging and creating opportunity for those, uh, those entities or those demographics that are typically underrepresented, such as women, such as you know uh, African-Americans. If that entity has done a disparity study, you are going to see goals and initiatives around that entity that they are going to be seeking um, spend in those specific demographics. You also have your suppliers and your subcontractors. That is you. You are the supplier. You are even potentially the subcontractor if you are um, working with a prime or a primary company that is bidding on a project. And then you have your contracting process. And this is where the nuts and bolts actually take place, where you are heavily engaged, where you are working on uh, responding to a solicitation, going through the evaluation process, looking at contract award, uh, 
hoping to look for a contract award to come to you. And then contract compliance, being able to maintain the requirements of that contract. And then lastly, I had to throw in technology and platforms. Uh, as we continue to grow, AI is becoming even a higher conversation in government contracting. But technology and platforms is really critical. You want to make sure you have access to platforms uh, and the technology required. So um, a lot of uh, processes are done electronically. And so I always like to throw that in there because that is a heavy component of working with uh, government agencies and going after those grant funds. If at any time you all have any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. I want to make sure that I am not missing anything. And while you're doing that, throw in the chat, getting to the money, because what we just talked about is what government contracting is. And I know it sounds like a big monster, but it can be navigated and it can uh, be successful for your business. I did this for 20 plus years, approved thousands of contracts, and there are um, suppliers and subcontractors that can live off of government contracting uh, when done correctly. So here are some benefits, things and reasons to maybe consider for your business model, uh, biz benefits of government contracting. Yes, I see it in the chat too. Getting to the money, absolutely. So it's the impact. That's why you want to do government contracting. That's why you want to go through the process of learning how to apply for those grants that the government is seeking. Uh, responses to. You want to know how to respond to those bids. You want to understand the process because it truly impacts sustainability when we're talking about revenue, creating market credibility, um, access to additional resources and networks, and even these business growth opportunities uh, for the long term, right? When we talk about sustainability, it's how do we create that continuity where there are no hiccups? There's this consistent um, flow of income um, and sustainability within your organization. And also it impacts then our community. And the community, you define it how you want, but as a business owner, you have the opportunity to uh, impact your community around you. But I also like to say, and some people may consider it cliche, but you also get to impact the greater community, the entire world. I told you at the federal level, this isn't any different than at the local level. The money is there and you have the business to impact it. So job creation, small business support, skill development. And then we also, we want to leave a legacy. I don't know about you. I have a 16-year-old daughter and all the work I do isn't just for me, right? It's for her and her children and her children and her children and the communities that she's going to impact, right? And so when we talk about even government contracting, it impacts your legacy. Some ways it does that, diversification and stability, because there is another avenue or another arm of income that you are uh, stepping into when you get into government contracting. Even brand recognition, being able able to, we, we look at McDonald's. McDonald's was created decades ago. But when we see those golden arches, we know exactly what it is. And even working in the government contracting space and establishing a great um, rapport and, and brand can speak volumes for years for you to come for your, um, for your business and for your legacy. So thank you for that, Johnny. Legacy building is a must. And these are just three reasons. Think about it worldwide, as well as at your business level, at the micro level. So that's the impact and why government contracting uh, is beneficial. And that's not an, uh, an all exhaustive list. I want to make sure I point that out. There are many, many other reasons that you may be able to identify specifically for your entity. Um, I like to throw out pro tips. Every government, every public agency is different. So proceed accordingly. Anything I share with you today, if you go to a government agency and you see a small variation, it's because every entity can be different. So what I offer today are very common, um, relatively general things that are going to happen within every agency that you approach for government, governmental uh, contracting and going after those grants. All right. So drop in the chat again, getting to the money as we get ready to talk about how government approaches contracting. So they're looking for vendors. They're looking for these subcontractors and these suppliers to provide these goods and services. Maybe it's the bakery. They're looking to bring in some cakes for an event. Maybe it's they're having an event for, and they need balloons in the marquee. Maybe it's STEM education for a special program that they have for maybe after school that they've received grants from the uh, federal level, right? Regardless of your entity or your particular business, you want to know how the government approaches contracting. So types of goods and services, they're looking for goods and commodities, uniforms, fuel, piping, sanitary products, 
and et cetera. And I put et cetera because that list is long, long lasting. If you ask me, I'll tell you, put it in the chat. Do they look for this? And I will give you an answer. And the answer is probably yes. On professional services, they're looking for architects, engineers, medical, um, medical professionals, legal professionals. In the construction space, maybe it's rehabbing, maybe it's building from the, um, from the bottom up. You're a general contractor and you work with other contractors to build out schools and communities and other types of buildings and parks, uh, park, uh, park um, um, additives, I should say. And then you also have those that are building roads. Um, and then you're non-professional, that's everything else, right? That's everything else from software development, tree trimming, consulting, janitorial, lawn care, you name it, the government looks for it. So don't ever, um, don't ever rule your business out from being able to do business with the government. It sometimes is more about timing um, than anything and actually research and digging and finding those resources. So those are types of goods and services. Now, when I talked about approach, what does the government use or what do these public agencies use to say, hi, we need your goods and your services, but we need you to tell us how much you're gonna charge us, tell us what is the quality of your work. Um, they, they're gonna ask all of these different questions through four primary methodologies I like to talk to. So invitation to bid, requests for quote, you may hear that, and that's usually set at a certain threshold. Um, it may be $50,000, it may be $100,000, depending again on the agency, but they may be just looking for lowest price. They know exactly what they want. They say, I need a pen. This is a blue pen. I don't know if you can see it. They needed to have a white foundation, but they want a blue tip, right? They may write, write the specifications exactly like that. And if they do, then you need to provide them, what is your price? And they're simply going to award based on their lowest price. Then there's the request for a proposal where they may know they want a community center, but they're not exactly sure how to go about um, securing or writing the specifications in detail. They want to know what is your approach or what is your proposal to solving a problem that they have to be able to procure goods and services for something. And when they are uh, submitting an RFP, which is what you will typically hear uh, in the industry, RFP, they are looking for best value. They don't care about just low price. Low price is what we look for in procurement because that we want to be good stewards, right? We want to be stewards of the funds that we are responsible for. However, we also want to make sure we're getting good quality. We want to make sure that we're bringing on the right people that are a good fit for the entity. So RFP, they're looking for best value and they're going to evaluate based on cost and your technical proposal. On your request for qualifications, they are looking for the best qualifications. They won't even evaluate or they are not evaluating pricing. So in these type of instances, they want to know the qualifications of your team. They want to know about previous projects. They want to know the success rate of those projects. Um, they want to know the innovation that you've used in those projects, right? They're going to have different questions that they're going to ask, but it's going to be strictly around the qualifications of that entity and being able to provide the good or service. A lot of times you'll find that in like engineering, you'll find it in architectural um, RFQs, you'll see it for uh, medical professionals, um, most times legal, things like that, those professional services that I mentioned previously. And then you have your request for information, which is not utilized as often as it should be, but it's a great tool that the government can use to come and kind of R&D, research and develop. They can go to the market and have questions asked to the vendors through this request for information process where it's, tell me what is the market doing? How should we go about doing X, Y, Z? And it's a great tool for the government entity to shape their specifications for say a future RFQ or a future RFP. But the only caveat on the RFI is that there isn't an award that's actually happened. However, you are now, once you submit on the RFI, you are now uh, in the clear vision of that agency and they know what your qualifications are. They know what, that you are tapping to the market some kind of way. And so when they get ready to do that RFQ or that RFP, they're looking at you. So you wanna make sure that you put in the chat for me, look at me, <laughs> look at my business, right? So don't rule out that RFI if you ever see that. But these are the four most common uh, ways that you will see governments go out to the market, reach out to the suppliers and say, hey, how can I um, get you to provide me a response to it? And they give you the specs. So 
that's what we want to do on contracting methodologies. If there are any questions behind that, again, feel free to drop it in the chat. And yes, let's keep getting to the money. So a few things they'll be looking for when we talk about agency requirements, those specifications. Uh, again, a non-exhaustive list, but these may be some requirements that I'm just going to point out a few. They want to know that you have your business and your professional licensing. So if you are to be certified or if you are to be required to have license in your county or your city or your state that you're in, make sure that you have it. Go have it. Go ahead and have it on deck and ready to submit when they ask. Uh, if there are bonding capacities that you need to um, have in place, make sure your bonding is available. Insurance. Um, maybe they want to know about your similar projects. And so you have to be ready to define what it's your uh, previous or similar projects you've done and what was the outcome? What were some of the hiccups? What were some of the gaps that you all were able to fill? Uh, maybe it's capacity. Do you all have the capacity to actually carry out the work that's being done? That's something I have to ask myself as a business owner before I actually apply for a grant or for a government contracting uh, opportunity. Do I have the capacity to do it? Am I going to be able to meet the timeline that they're actually looking for? And your response should align and show them whether or not your capacity is there. And then it could be even about references. They want to maybe sometimes call your references. And don't think this is like some applications where you put references and they never contact them. You will have agencies that will absolutely contact your references. So make sure that you even have those available. And those are just a few things. Even on minority, women-owned, LGBTQ+, veteran, and small businesses, if those are requirements, you need to make sure that either your business model is already established and had and meets one of those requirements, or you have someone on your team or people or several companies on your team that meet those requirements as well. So just a few um, kind of typical requirements that, or capabilities that they would be looking for uh, in RFPs and RQs and even in some of those um, invitation for bids that I mentioned. So we're gonna keep getting to the money if there are no questions. And if, uh, let me see, let me make sure I'm doing okay. Y'all give me thumbs up or something if y'all are, this information is good. Awesome. Thank you, Johnny, for that. I want to make sure I'm giving you what you need. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Pro tip, apply for specialty certifications if they fit your business model. I mentioned just a minute ago about minority, LGBTQ, small, uh, small businesses. If this is something you want to have a part of your business, make sure that you are applying for those specialty certifications. I'll be honest, we could do a completely separate session on this. So just wanted to make sure I mentioned that to you. So as you're continuing to explore, um, identify if that's a good business model for you. So we're going to keep getting to the money. How do you actually get started? How do we get started with government contracting? First, you want to become a supplier. That is step one. Drop in the chat, become a supplier. Yes, that means you need to be on record with the agency that you are going to be doing business with. You need to be on record in their system with all of your information, your financial information, your business organizational information. You want to be on their radar. And the way that you are on their radar is because you have become a supplier. So let's talk about it. All right, so to become a supplier, you want to make sure you register utilizing the system that they've identified. That means you've been on their website. You've looked to identify how to go on and register. You've already looked at the application and you've identified the data that they need you to input. But make sure you register to become a uh, supplier using the agency's method of registration. As creative as we like to be sometimes, do not try to register any other way but the way that they ask. So make sure that you really align and comply with that. You also want to research and identify opportunities. Many agencies, those opportunities are um, actually sent to you as a courtesy or as a notification of here's a business opportunity based on the goods and services you registered in our system about. Um, I'm sorry, you registered in our system and now here are some opportunities for you. So know that when you get on their radar and you've identified what your goods and services are, they can then contact you so that they can let you know opportunities. But when I say research, sometimes the opportunities won't jump out at you and you may actually just need to research. You may have a dedicated individual or resource that does nothing but <laughs> scour um, different opportunities on the uh, internet at different agencies to become familiar with those entities. Um, so research and identify those opportunities. And then once you have actually become a supplier, 
And if anything changes about your business, this is very critical. Make sure that you maintain that supplier registration. So if you go from sole proprietor to, to LLC, or maybe if you change your address, maybe be your physical or your remit to address, whatever changes about your business, make sure every entity you are registered with is aware of that. Even if you grow your business and expand your services, when you register, you get to tell them that. So make sure you go back and let them know, hey, I've scaled up. This is now a new product I offer, or our services now cover this particular um, um, component. So make sure that you are maintaining your supplier profile. Want to just do a quick snapshot to show you kind of what the registration profile um, um, applications could look like. If we pay very close attention to the far left, because this is the one that's probably most common for all of us, it's the federal government. And this is SAM.gov. So if you are looking to do business with the federal government, SAM.gov is where you would land first so that you could get your unique ID number. And once you get that unique ID D number, you're kind of now on their radar, right? You now get to do business with the federal government through their procurement process. So just showing at the federal level, there are gonna be different kinds at the state, county and schools. So um, wherever you are, and then that's just four examples, the other public entities as well, whether it's a utility agency, they're gonna all have their own separate unless they're collaborating and working together. So just wanted to point that out. I think that's always a little helpful. All right, study the potential agencies that you wanna service. You wanna do that by defining a list of agencies to do business with. Sometimes we are hoping vendors, hey, do business with me because I'm so awesome. Nope, you have the right to be empowered and actually um, interview and determine which businesses fit your model, right? Which agencies fit your model. So define that list, look around you at different agencies that are uh, close in, um, in, in a region maybe, or in your city, but also even at the federal level, but make a list of the agencies that you wanna do business with so you're more targeted. And then you can focus on understanding those specific agencies, contracting policies and processes so that you can be in compliance as well as be protected to make sure that the process is going transparently and fairly as it should. Um, you also wanna make sure that you can create those introductions with the buyers or the professionals in the procurement office or in the contracting office so that they can help guide you when you run into a snag or if you've got specific questions um, they may you know that relationship obviously uh, will help you now doesn't mean you're going to get a leg up or you shouldn't because it should always still be a fair and transparent process but make sure that you try to build those relationships so that you can get in front of those agencies and sell what you have. And then also there's an opportunity through public records most times if they don't have it on a public facing website, go and find out what they have bought in the past. Do a public records request. If you know you sell pens, I'll stick with my pen example. If you know you sell pens, then you need to go to the public records office and say, I want a list of all the vendors that you all have awarded pens to. I know how much they are. So I always like to encourage vendors to know that you have at your fingertips a lot of times the information you need so that you can build out your responses so that you know where pricing may need to land um, so that you can have some comparativeness um, as you're uh, uh, analyzing um, how you want to respond and if you want to do business with the agency. All right. So best practices. But before I go into best practices, I want to see it again. Getting to the money because we just talked about how you want to get started. Now you've got your supplier um, number and whatever agencies that you've identified, but we are ready to get into best practices. So throughout the entire process, what do you need to make sure you're focused on? One, you need to make sure you're starting early. I don't know what that means to you, but that means being proactive. That means researching. That means going ahead, having your business structure in place. I always encourage you to keep all of your business documentation in one centralized place because as you get off into government contracting, you'll find it'll be so much easier just to upload some of the same documents over and over and over again to satisfy those requirements of the agency. So start early. Make sure that you're proactive. Be willing to collaborate whether you're collaborating internally with the agency itself, because you have to be willing to collaborate with them sometimes. There may be opportunities for you all to negotiate. Um, in, in negotiation, there is absolute 
communication and negotiation, but you also may want to consider collaborating with other vendors. Um, maybe you're stronger in one area, but the scope of the project uh, that's being presented by the government agency may need you to bring on some other experts. So be willing to collaborate and know that you don't have to do it all and that you do need to make sure that your team is solid and comprehensive in a way to satisfy those goods and services and present the best story. Demonstrate your differentiation. Talking about story, put in the chat, tell your story, because that's what you are doing when you're responding to government contracting uh, opportunities. You want to make sure that you can demonstrate the differentiation. What makes you different? What makes my pen, my blue pen, any more special than the blue pen they can go to um, Office Max and go buy tomorrow, right? You got to be able to tell what's unique. What is unique about your entity? And that could be a variety of things, but be able to tell your story that clarifies the differentiation and the value add that you bring possibly over another competitor. So keep telling your story. Make sure that you comply with every requirement. If they say turn the bid in by two o'clock PM Central Standard Time, I don't care that traffic was uh, backed up or maybe you couldn't get the parking spot right outside the building or maybe your computer would uh, crashed on you and you couldn't press in. I promise you, as much as we want or uh, procurement professionals want, um, as much competition as they can get, we still have to make sure that we're fair, firm, and consistent. And so make sure that you are complying with all those requirements so that you do not get kicked out of a process simply because you are not maybe following one of the requirements. If they want a business license, turn it in, okay? Um, so I like to be real and keep it with you. I have had to turn many away for very small reasons. If something has to be notarized, get it notarized. Um, so make sure that you comply with every requirement of their document. Ask questions for clarification. Again, you get to be in the driver's seat to a degree when you're dealing with government agencies. Ask questions. They sometimes will have periods of time that you have to be able to ask those questions. But again, if you're reading the document, if you understand what all the requirements are, um, you know that there's a specific period that they may want you to ask questions. So ask those questions to get the clarity. I don't care how small. I don't care how large. I don't care how complex you may feel like the question is. Make sure you are asking questions so that you can be empowered and you are clear on what the expectations are so that you can submit a winning proposal. So during the solicitation, so we talked about those are things you want to do before you even get started, right? Or as you're going, I'm sorry, as you're going through it throughout the process. So let's talk about what do we do before the solicitation. Define and execute your business structure, as I mentioned. Make sure you understand your market. Um, make sure that your documents are maintained in a centralized location. Make sure, again, I just said, make sure that you know your market, know your competitors. Um, that is, I mean, locally, you should be able to know who your competitors are. If you are a bakery, you probably know who some of your competitors are, right? Keep digging, keep researching, even at a national level. You want to understand the goods and services. You want to understand pricing of your market. All those things are really important because the government um, procurement offices, they have done their due diligence or the user departments, they've done their due diligence on the market. And so you want to make sure you have done your due diligence as well. So drop that in the chat, due diligence, because that's really, really important. Establish a strong professional brand. Your reputation matters. Before you ever get to that government agency, you should have already been doing the work and making sure that you are establishing a strong professional brand. But you also want to make sure that when you get ready to present, that it's um, it's evident and you can see it clearly in your response. So that's pre-solicitation. So let's talk about when you are actually preparing a response. You found the opportunity. You know it fits your business model. You know that you're qualified and now you're ready to submit. This one is really easy. It takes us back to what, second grade, first grade even. Thoroughly read and understand the solicitation documents. I can't tell you how many times I may have had to um, disqualify someone from a process simply because I could tell they didn't read. They skipped over a page that required um, one small marking or required something to be notarized or required it to be um, have eight copies made as opposed to two copies that you submit. So make sure that you thoroughly read and understand that document. Tell a story about your business, as I stated. Tailor your bid. While there are going to be some standard things that you're going to have in that centralized location that you're going to always upload, each 
agency's requirements are different. And so you want to tailor that accordingly. Just like you apply for a job and you submit your resume based on that specific job, we go change keywords and we hope that it can get picked up by the system, right? You want to do the same thing with your bid proposals or your, your RFP responses that you're doing. You want to make sure that you are tailoring it specifically to that agency requirement. You want to make sure that your cost proposal is strong. And that means, again, you've researched your market, you've uh, tested your own pricing model, and you know what works. Um, and so make sure that your cost proposal is strong. And you can utilize tools like the public records that I mentioned, or finding those forecasted contracting opportunities um, to be able to build out that cost proposal. Develop a strong technical proposal. Again, I don't care what you hear. A lot of times it's, oh, the government just wants you to get the lowest price. Nope, we talked about it. RFPs, RFQs, we're looking for quality. We're looking for best value, the full picture. And so make sure that your technical components as well. How are you innovative? How are you approaching the timeline that they're asking for? How are you utilizing your capacity and your staff to be able to satisfy the requirements? Make sure that you have a strong technical bid response as well. And then develop a, a strong past bid performance. I mean, performance bid. So if you're working with anyone today, don't feel like you um, won't need to share that message later, right? So document those opportunities or those contracts or those awards that you've received in other pl uh, places for your work. Document it and show you know what happened at the beginning. What did you satisfy? What were maybe some of the hiccups that you overcame? But you want to be able to tell that story again in your bid proposal as you are preparing your response. So when we talk about post solicitation, this is after an evaluation is taking place by the department or by the procurement agency, and they determine who they are going to give an award to. Now, we're going to always say you can submit a winning bid. There is no such thing as not being able to always submit a winning bid. You may not get the award, but you prepared that bid in a way that gives them everything that they need. And sometimes it just doesn't shake out for us, but it doesn't mean that your bid was not a winning bid. So I always like to say that. So let's get into what happens post solicitation. Win, lose, or draw, you need to evaluate what happened, right? You want to know the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent. How could you have done better? How could you have um, maybe leveraged another component of your business a different way? And you can do that in a few ways. One, you want to research what happened. You want to, again, go to that public records request, obtain the records from that specific bid response so that you can see was everything done fairly. Um, and you also get to identify whether or not you found, um, you, you responded the way you needed to respond best. And you can compare other uh, bid responses. And if you find out that maybe something didn't go quite right in the process and maybe you should have gotten the award or maybe you identify another vendor should have gotten it versus the one that did, you have the right to submit a protest and appeal. Now, please know that that name, uh, the word protest is like Mufasa. <laughs> and um, like I shiver and shake. That's not something that governmental agencies like to see come their way. But I know that it is a tool, and I've always known that it's a tool that, again, empowers the process to ensure that it is fair and transparent and that even suppliers feel that they can absolutely um, receive the, the best advantage or best um, process as they're going through it. So you're going to determine if you need to submit a protest or an appeal. You can also request a debriefing with agencies. Many suppliers don't do this. Maybe you submitted a bid, and even if you won or didn't win, you want to know how could you, how did you shake out? How did they evaluate you? What was their logic behind it? What were some of their needs that you um, did or didn't meet? Request that debriefing with that agency. Um, they'll bring in the scores, the actual people that scored through evaluators, I should say. And they'll also bring in other stakeholders that were a part of that process. And you can ask questions specific to your proposal so that you can enhance it in the future. So, um, as I stated, submit your public records request as you need to. And then again, once, let's say you have won the award, you have received that award, Kristen and Pins, that's the name of my company today, Kristen and Pins actually won an award. Well, now I need to make sure I perform exactly as that contract says, right? Because we don't want to be disqualified for future projects. We, wanna, we don't want to be debarred. We don't want to not be considered uh, because of the way we handled maybe a current contract. So make sure that you comply 
comply, comply with all of the terms of the awarded contract. So those are, I guess that was, I'm sorry, that was post solicitation. Drop in the chat so that I know y'all are still here with me, getting to the money. And again, if you have questions, drop those in the chat as well. We are almost getting ready to wrap up. So it's a mindset. Government contracting is a mindset, you all. Um, you have to be intentional about it. And it really does require you to shift your thought process to make sure um, that you are um, patient, you are prepared, all of that. So I'm not going to dig anymore. I just want you to know that it's a mindset. And here are some things to consider. Be realistic. Be open. Be prepared, as you've heard me state. Be willing to ask questions. Be committed to the process. If you start it, make sure you finish it all the way through. Be patient. Wherever your patient pants are, make sure that you put them on. Be willing to defend. If you, if you get that award, you better make sure you do a darn good job so that you can defend your work. You want to be able, because there are times that you may legally have to defend your work. So make sure that you are able to and willing to defend the work that you, um, that you do and even the proposal that you submit. Be willing to collaborate, as I mentioned earlier. Be responsible and responsive. And those will help you with your mindset as you move forward through the contracting process. All right. So pro tip, as I stated earlier, every bid or proposal submitted can be a winning bid or proposal, award or no award. So I'm gonna stop right there and let y'all get in the chat again, getting to the money, sustainability, community and legacy. And I'm going to stop right there because I think we have some time if we can do questions. And I apologize because I think I'm still having um, audio issues. So if you could maybe put it in the chat. I apologize. No, it's not the most efficient, but I have all eyes um, on here. Let me see. It looks like somebody has their hands raised. All Johnny. right, I can hear you all now. I am ready, Miss Johnny. Come on with the question. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. This is wonderful. I was just speaking with a young lady earlier this morning uh, who was um, putting something like this together. And this is so great information. So God knows how to answer a prayer. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to your slide on pre-solicitation. Okay. Um, so if so being a first time applying for a government contract and you may not have I think the slide mentioned uh, about telling your story or let me see if I can if you go back to some comfort sorry about this that's you okay I'll wait for you to go back there all right all right so okay yes uh, so uh, the, the thought earlier was coming to me about if this is your first time applying and you may not have a strong, um, I don't know if a strong story to draw from or just like uh, you may not have uh, had a, another contract that you can draw from to show how you have, um, how you have built your business or have an example that you can use to put in your pre-solicitation. Uh, I just wondered what would you use to develop that if this is your first time? If it's your first time and that is a requirement and you don't necessarily have the um, the heavy background they're looking for or that past performance, then you need to make sure that you really strengthen the story of what it is you do, okay, right? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that's the part that you really have to leverage. Now, full transparency and being honest, if you don't have those and it's a requirement for you to have past experience, mm -hmm. then it may not be time for your business to take on. It may not fit your right. business model just at this time, but I wouldn't wash it all away. I think it's about making sure that you leverage other, other parts of your RFP or your bid mm -hmm. response to really um, kind of, you know, pique their interest uh, mm -hmm. a bit more. So that would be my recommendation, but definitely full honesty. They may say, hey, she doesn't have the past so we've got to move on. But that doesn't mean don't continue to go get that pass so you can come back to them later. Yeah, very good. Okay, I just wondered about that. So thank you. No, absolutely. That's a very good question. Thank you for that, Ms. John. And I've seen you all in the chat. Thank you for all of that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? This was really, really thorough. Um, uh -oh. 
Will you provide the recording for review to rewatch? Um, yes. So it would be on YouTube and I can send out that link for you. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to go back and watch. I think I would probably pick up some more information. Awesome, awesome. So just as a recap, we talked about, you know, understanding government contractors' benefits, how they approach contracting, how to get started, and exploring best practices. I definitely want to make sure that I shared my information, if it's here, and it is. Can you all see that? Yes. Awesome, awesome. Yes. So if you'd like to go to the website, if you all want to connect afterwards, I'm on LinkedIn. I would love to be able to uh, share more information because I do know that this is a very robust uh, conversation that can happen for hours and hours and hours uh, as you go through the process. Absolutely. May I ask one more question? Please. So if you work for a government agency, um, but you're, you also have your own business that you're developing outside, can you apply for a government uh, contract for, uh, um, you, the work that you do on the side? How does that Absolutely. So, <laughs> okay. so keep in mind, I was the director or the chief procurement officer, right? So I had to make sure I was walking a very clear and non-conflicting line yes. whenever I did that. So if there were an agency that I know I impacted directly, mm -hmm. um, I would not touch it at all. Um, it. But I, as I, I was continuing to build my business, because I haven't um, been in, I, let me say, I shifted in April to full-time um, entrepreneurship. But when I was still building my business out in the last four years, mm -hmm. I just wouldn't go to the agencies or I wouldn't work with the suppliers that I know wanted to do business with my agency okay. um, to make sure that there wasn't a conflict of interest. So I always say also check your um, entity's conflict of interest policy, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. in case there's a variation from what I just mentioned. They may have something more stringent where you can't work with any of them, but I would say verify that. But typically if there's no direct conflict, mm -hmm. um, there shouldn't be a problem with it at all. And uh, I, I, I did other governmental agencies while I was a chief procurement officer. So absolutely. All right, that's good. Thank you so much. Very good information. Right. Absolutely, I appreciate those questions. Any other questions? All right, I think that I can turn it back over to Southern. Oh no, Stephanie, you came off. I saw you. Come on, Stephanie. <laughs> that question. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll just um, ask because I've, I've actually applied for government um, um, uh, NSF grant before. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think this was raised in your previous question, but it is, um, you know, when you're going up against, um, you know, bigger companies or, you know, a lot more, um, let's say, you know, in STEM education, I'm going up against the YMCA or mm -hmm. Girl Scouts or an organization that's just obviously been around forever, a lot more mm -hmm. data, a lot more bigger brand. How, how do you compete in a government contract or even a, a, any other type of grant where you know that there's other players that are also competing for the same funding. And how do you, and you said strengthen your story, but again, how do you really, any other details you can add about that? Because that's been my experience when I'm applying for a really large grant, that's mm -hmm. like a lot of funding is, it's just so many bigger players competing for that. Understood. So I say, look at a couple things and you and you'll be able to uh, probably as I'm saying this, you'll be able to say, nope, that wasn't it. Or, or yes, that was it. Uh, one, the relationship building, I think is really, really important, because, again, when you are submitting, say, that RFP response, these are humans looking at your packet and they're scoring. Right. So but if you've already built the relationship, if you've had those vendor introductions, psychologically, humans operate a certain way. And I've met Stephanie Epsi, Espy, and I know that she does great work. I talked to her, I, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm going to throw out relationships, one, which I know can still create some fluidness there. So I'm not saying that's the answer to all be all. The second one I would say is willing to um, introduce collaboration or subcontracting to one of those larger agencies. If going into that process, you see, oh, this is going to be the YMCA is going to be all over this, or Girls Incorporated is going to be all over this. Well, maybe I need to go have a conversation with Girls Incorporated, or I need to have a conversation with the YMCA to see where I can fit into their particular proposal so that I can start to build out my own business performance, as well as still be able to work on that project and get a piece of the pie. 
So I would say that may be another option, a strategic way to get in the door as you're continuing to build out your new business. Yeah, yeah. And thank, look, Stephanie, thank you for pressing that question again, because it did make me kind of think of those additional strategies. Thank you. Absolutely. Other questions? Let's see. I have one, Kristen. Yes. What's the best way to get started? Like when you're in the beginning of phases of structuring your business as far as registering, all that stuff, what would you say is the best place to start? And are you saying just actually start? starting your business, like getting your uh, business license. Like getting, your, yeah, getting the licenses, um, EIN, like all of that stuff. I always encourage you to go to your state website, your state, your governor, um, they use your, let me say, secretary of state and, you know, those mm -hmm. type of entities. They are like the, um, the, the seat, the doorkeepers, I should say, to you being registered at the state level. They'll tell you on those same sites where to go within your county. If you have to get a business license, um, here in Shelby County, if you don't make more than $3,000 or don't anticipate making more than $3,000 annually, you don't need a business license. But I will say oh, okay. if you start at, that, at the state level, become registered at the state level or just navigate that website because you're going to be, you need to be registered at the state level for sure. But uh, use that website to then direct you on your next steps. They even have tools on there that tells you, you know, okay, now you need to maybe look at a CPA. Maybe you need to get this type of team member. So a lot of uh, at the state level, even at the county level, I've seen uh, where the uh, business office, business license office may have those resources available. But the state should definitely uh, be a great place to start. Um, if you don't know any specific resources or agencies, they kind of do it independently. And there are some out there, but I think the freest, because I'm always on free, because you will have people in this space that's going to try and pull every dime out of you to get your work done, go to that state level yeah. uh, where it's free so that you can get those resources. And they're going to spell it out for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great question. What else? I need a hard one, y'all. I need y'all to stump me. Come on. <laughs> Give me something. I just like, come on. What I need to go study. No, but if, if there aren't any more, um, I know you all are probably digesting, right? You may not have any right now, um, but please continue to digest, continue to be inquisitive about the process, um, continue to go and identify those agencies you want to do business with so that you can start to navigate and penetrate those agencies. Um, and I'm just a LinkedIn away or email away. Um, and I'll do what I can to share information because I do not believe in hoarding info. There is truly thousands and millions of dollars out there. Billions with a B. <laughs> with a B. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. I'm Kristen Webb with the Grady Leadership Series, and I'm going to turn it over. Thank you so much. Oh, Joy, I saw you. You was about to say something. I'm trying to hang up because I'm on double here. I'm on here twice, so that's my life. Uh, you can speak. <laughs> Thank you, Krista. I learned a lot. I personally do not have a business, but I learned some new insights. Um, that was very informative. Um, thank you, you all, for joining us at the Sage Circle each and every third Thursday. And if you would like to watch, rewatch this Sage Circle, you can find it on our YouTube. I did put the chat, the link in the chat, and I will resend this out to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Blessings.